Joseph Sadowski? I assume that's correct. All right, we'll go with that. <laughs> Each side will have 15 minutes to present your arguments. The appellate may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal when you come to the podium. Let me know if you want to reserve time and how much, and I'll do my best to keep track for you. The arguments are being visually and audibly recorded to be posted online, so please keep your voices up and remain behind the podium. Should there be any children or victims involved, don't use their names, just use initials or uh, refer to them in some other way. We've read your brief and we are ready to begin when you are. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, my, name, my, my name is Dave Gedrock, I'm the attorney for Mr. Sadowski, the appellant. Um, Inasmuch as this was a rather short trial, there's not a lot of what you throw out the opening statements and the voir dire and the closing arguments. My argument is going to be rather brief too. Right? And we can say five minutes, but I think I'll probably be done in five minutes just at this part of the stage. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, as far as the manifest way insufficiency, on the issue of theft, I'm going to focus on my stronger point in a minute. No evidence was presented that was consistent with, as related to the spider alarm, did it or did it not go off? No evidence was ever presented that the spider alarm was ever found, and no evidence was ever presented that the client was seen removing the spider alarm. I think my strongest argument, though, is in resisting the arrest conviction. <clears throat> my client was heard to be aggressively yelling. He was not listening to the officers. Supposedly, he tried to pull his arm away, but the officers can't agree if it was one arm or both arms. They don't agree on that issue. Secondly, they grabbed him because he didn't stop. But stopping isn't resisting arrest. It must be some sort of, it's more likely it's actually obstructing business, official business. No evidence was ever presented that the defendant knew he was being arrested. And that knowing such, he nevertheless resisted by force or hindrance. <coughs> In fact, the officers testified that for officer safety, they grabbed his arm. They did what they called the escort. So the knee strike that occurred when the defendant still didn't know that he was under arrest, in essence, really amounted to a form of gratuitous violence, excessive force. They didn't know, he didn't know he was under arrest. Mm -hmm. Resisting arrest requires that he do some overt act. Even a passive resisting arrest requires some sort of overt act. And all he did was he walked away from some people that grabbed his arms. And that's all he did. There's no evidence he flailed away. There's no evidence he threatened the officers. There's no evidence that he threatened to shoot them, harm them, or attack them, or anything. He was just was walking away out of the store when his officers, for officer's safety, escorted him and grabbed his arms. And again, there's no evidence that he knew he was under arrest at that time. So if he's being charged with resisting arrest, he has to know he's under arrest. That means the case law that I researched in preparation for today. That's basically my argument. I told you to be brief to the point. Okay. Thank, Thank you. I just wanted to double check. Is there a video of the actual resist, uh, alleged resisting arrest? I'm not, I can't, I can't recall. I don't know for a You can probably ask the prosecution. You probably know better. Thank you. Thank you. Please, the court, for the record, Tom Morris, uh, representing the state of Ohio and the city of Wadsworth. Um, there is video. Uh, there was video, multiple videos, showing the incident from different car angles. The uh, Wadsworth Police Department is uh, equipped with dashboard cams and audio mics that travel with the officers. They don't have uh, the, um, the, the uh, video cameras on the officers, but there was cars that were parked appropriate. Uh, in this case, we had one where it was just target the, the uh, uh, victim in the case uh, called the authorities because there was somebody that was um, allegedly uh, stealing DVDs. That's what they saw or what they thought they saw. And then was uh, over by the uh, devices that had uh, a spider equipment, and that's just the, the security device that goes around it that has um, uh, these little spider web type things. Uh, and there was a, uh, a top of some of the things when you pull off target, you can't get off. You have to have somebody come in and unlock it for you, and then they can pull off. Um, that was slit. That was cut. 
uh, by something. And so because they didn't know if this gentleman had a knife or scissors, uh, they called the police. That's their procedure. They don't go stop somebody who may be armed, may have a deadly weapon. Um, Lato police met with Mr. Sadowski as he was coming out. They had ID'd him. They were in contact with the loss prevention to make sure they got the right guy. Um, there was probable cause because they saw him stealing stuff. Uh, they come out. They attempt to stop him, to talk to him. Uh, he begins to quickly uh, start uh, moving out again. They tell him to stop. They tell him you're resisting. He doesn't stop. Uh, he uh, fights back and pulls against them so they can try to when they try to handcuff him to secure him, uh, he refuses to do that. While he's doing that, it falls out of his coat. Uh, two DVDs that he stole and a, uh, a prepaid cell phone, which is the other thing that he stole when he was there. Um, and at that point, he's continued to fighting with them. You can see it on the video. Um, and uh, at that point, they, uh, I'm not sure the, the euphemism they used, they gave him a Charlie horse, but they did. Uh, they uh, struck him in the, in the arm or in the leg uh, to kind of break his uh, um, resistance so they could get his arms back there as they're trained to do. Um, then they got him uh, secured and then at some point he went down uh, it, and uh, what the state believes was pretending to have a seizure. I believe he was pretending to have a seizure because uh, when the officer picked up his phone in an attempt to uh, give it back to him, uh, he said, hey, I didn't give you permission to do that and then the seizure stopped. So it was, um, it gave indications that somebody that was not being truthful and, and forthright in his medical condition. Um, that's what happened. Uh, that's the uh, resisting arrest. He didn't follow the lawful order to stop. I'm trying to arrest you. You're not doing it. You're fighting me. You're putting the, uh, not letting me handcuff you. The criminal tools. He had a pair of scissors on. And that's what he used to cut the top of the prepaid cell phone. Uh, and presumably what he cut the spider web off with. Uh, we don't know that. They couldn't find that. Um, and uh, the, uh, the theft, he had the, the stuff on him that, that they saw him steal. Uh, when I was listening to, to the council's argument, uh, it seemed like some of it was getting into illegal search. Uh, I point out to the court, there's no motion to suppress in this case, uh, which would suggest that we need to go through that Fourth Amendment analysis. Certainly we can do that if you'd like. Uh, it's clearly a, a proper search, but uh, that wasn't something that was brought up uh, at the uh, level. And, uh, so it was a trial issue. Uh, it got to the jury. The jury came back 15 minutes or so, finding him guilty. Did, was there testimony? I know the loss prevention officer testified. Was there testimony that the, the items found on him were actual target items? Yes. Uh, and there was, I made sure to ask him if these weren't free, were they? So they did have value to them as well. Um, so yeah, he said no, they were not free and they were targeted. Did he go through the checkout line? With other items? Yeah, he bought, uh, which is not uncommon. Uh, what we see is people will go and buy something small uh, with stuff in them to try to throw the scent off, so to speak. Uh, in this case, it was paper plates, I believe. So he walked out with paper plates. Also, he used to identify him. Uh, a man in this coat just bought paper plates. He's coming towards you. Man in the same coat comes out with paper plates. He also knew who it was. So the receipt had paper plates on them and not the other items? Correct. Else. Thank you. I think I'll be briefer than I was earlier. Okay. Just make a couple of points. Uh, first off, I, I was not attempting to make an argument about a seizure, a proper seizure, a search, or a suppression argument. Um, I want to correct a couple of things. Number one, the items fell out once he was already on the ground after having been getting a knee shot, uh, whatever they want to call it, charge or whatever they want to call it. That's when it struck. Now, they didn't find it on him before they did that. They did that before the items fell to the ground and before they had told him he was under arrest. He was uh, Traditionally, officers consider somebody under arrest once they've handcuffed him because now they have control over the person. At this point in time, you got to remember that the officers said that they approached him and they grabbed his arms for officer safety. They never said at that point in time to initiate the process of an arrest. And the arrest occurred once he was handcuffed. At that point in time, that's when you look to see if he's resisting. He can, somebody comes up behind him and grabs his arms. The actual reaction for anybody is to pull away to find out who this person is, why is somebody grabbing my arms. And the officer's current agree as to how many arms he supposedly 
it's pretty funny him trying to resist with a one arm or two arm. And I think that goes toward whether the actions they took to gain control of him were appropriate. So again, my main argument is that the resisting arrest is not sustained by the evidence. It's against the manifest weights of the evidence. And for that part, I'm not going to waste the court's time with the cutting and the uh, um, uh, tools, criminal tools. I'm focusing on what I think I did. And I think that's the case that should be overturned to his conviction for resisting arrest. Thank you. Was, was the officer safety because of the concern about there being a knife or some cutting device on him? Sure, I understand um, that. But also, generally, but that the officers testified to it. They did, I agree. And I have that same thing going in the federal case right now, too. But you have to show some sort of overt act in a resisting arrest, either if it's active resisting arrest or passive resisting arrest, there is a requirement for an overt act. And the fact that the man uh, shrugged his arms is not the same thing as pulling a gun, threatening to kill the officers, uh, threatening or making any uh, threats against the officer's family or anything. It was no overt act in furtherance of resistance arrest. At the best, I think it would be called non-compliance. And non-compliance also is not enough to justify an arrest. It takes more. It takes some sort of overt act on behalf of the defendant. And that's not here. And that's why the resistance arrest should be open to Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation. The court will take a matter under advisement and issue a written decision, which will be mailed to both sides as well as posted on our website and website of the Supreme Court.